effort. I just got to say it to somebody. I had just written Flick Lives on the blackboard. When my teacher caught me right in the act, he said, do you know what you've done? I said, what have I done, sir? He says, you have just earned detention for the whole year. Well, I sank out of my seat. I can't go out for baseball now this year, Shepard. How can I face my father? Oh, am I in for it? Oh. Hey, a lot of you know, we're all in for it, kid. Every last one of us. And uh, would you please just uh, get ready in there, Corny? There's a lot of guys that are in for it, kid. You're not the only one. In fact, uh, everywhere you look, the fight is going on. We have here a little note that says there was an old man of Calcutta who coated his tonsils with butter. <laughs> Corny looks at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I didn't write this, Corny. This is the famous, famous poet, which shows you what fame is made out of, man. There was an old man of Calcutta who coated his tonsils with butter, thus converting his snore from a thunderous roar to soft, oleaginous mutter. <laughs> oh, is that a bad mother? That, 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 come on, bring it up to the corner. Let's go all together, gang, now. Just the place for a snark. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? Come on home, old Bill Bailey. You come on home, Bill Dad. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Come on, come on home. Bring it up, big corny. Da 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 I'll pay the rent, Bill Bailey. I'll pick up the bills. Won't you come home? Come on back home. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? All right, that's enough of that crying out loud. That's terrible, man. But uh, can I feel this great weeping for all of mankind? Everywhere you look, there's the battle going on. Did you see this piece in the New York Post from last Tuesday? I mean, the, the clash is going much beyond. You know, they keep talking about the clash between the generations, and uh, it's getting really serious. In the Post, assistant professor of English, Kristen Edwards, 28, a willowy blonde, looks very attractive in miniskirts. But Murray Edwards, her husband, does not care for mini pants, especially when his wife creates them by cutting up his conservative stockbroker's trousers. <laughs> You know, I just wonder. Now, I'm going to bring up a question here. I'm, I'm just, uh, seriously, it has to be brought up. I wonder how many marriages are on the verge of busting up or have busted up because a hippie, I mean, deep down in his soul, married the ultimate of squaredom. And on the other hand, a chick hippie, has married this guy who really believes in stocks and bonds. <laughs> oh, she, you know, there's nothing worse than... The, oh, no, I, th I think this... Uh, you know, this, this play has never been written yet. They keep writing these plays with a sexual base. But I think sex is... You know, that's pretty basic. I mean, no problem there in most cases. But what is worse than to see two people arguing about whether they should go see The Sound of Music? And, you know, the chick says, what do you mean sound of music? And uh, she's holding out for, you know, let's go on and turn on or something. He says, well, what do you mean? And she sits there, and he brings out a picture of him in a magazine. He says, now, here's a great actress, and he holds up this picture of uh, Julie Andrews. And the chick says, Julie Andrews, I'm going to flow up. And uh, <laughs> the next thing you know, she's at an Andy Warhol movie, and he's sitting down there, and he's watching Doris Day and Rock Hudson. And I think, I think this is fantastic. I think this is one of the splits between the kids, you know, and people. Uh, that, they're, that they're digging and hearing another scene. And, and you can never, you can never reconcile the two. I mean, they just, they just constantly uh, clash. This kid wrote to me, and he said, Shepard, he said, man, he said, uh, tell a story of the great generator hunt. 
Oh, it's a great generator. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, do you have a march in there for me, please? Something big and important. Salute it. Hit it. Hit it big. Bring it in there. Big. Hit it big there. Hello, hello, hello. Hit it big. There we go. That's big enough. Excellent. What did you do? Skip out of the groove there? Eh, well, sit right in the middle. It doesn't matter. You can play the Stars and Stripes forever from either end, and it sounds the same. It really doesn't matter. All right. Once again, it is time for your assignment. Bring it up big, Corny. Come on. That's just, keep it up there. Very good. It is time for your assignment. Okay. All right, all right. Time for the assignment. Right, get ready out there. Get out your pencil and paper. What does this thing say here? Oh, boy, I can't read that on the air. Holy smokes. There are some people who can't tell one thing from another. Ella Sanders from Whistler's Mother. A porcupine quill from a peacock feather. A buffalo. It's getting serious. From a Florentine leather. Oh, what a great word I just couldn't use in the air. They bob up and down like bones in a stew. Don't know their blank from a sassafras root. And couldn't pour blank from a cowhide boot with complete instructions on the heel. <laughs> well, it's not me. I mean, they're talking about knee-high orange there. But uh, nevertheless, uh, get ready with the, uh, with the band in there. We're going to use it corny. A guy sent me a clip from an army, from an army newspaper. Now, as an old ex-army type man, reading this clip, were you ever in the army, Connie? Never. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little about it tonight. Uh, here is a, here's a clipping from an army newspaper, and this is a the guy who sent it to me is one of the heroes in the story. I won't use his name, but he appears in the story. And it's taken from a Signal Corps newspaper that was published at the camp where at one time I festered. And it is entitled, the headline reads, Hike 25 miles in 4 hours 52 minutes. And it goes on, it says, by Private Walter J. Cohen. Establishing a record for other hardy camp crowder soldiers to shoot at, <laughs> boy, I'll bet, six men of the 282nd Signal Pigeon Company hiked 25 miles in four hours and 52 minutes with light packs. The six men who finished the grueling grind with endurance to spare included Corporal Francis Bartho, Sergeant Peter Gioso, Tom Tyson, Privates Wallace Went, Vincent Tiaxera, and John Bartasenovich. Each carried with them a bar of chocolate and a quarter-filled canteen of water. A week before the entire company had made the same march in slightly under eight hours, and it included the usual hourly breaks. During a bull session that night back in camp, good old Camp Crowder, Corporal Bartho expressed the belief that he could make the jaunt in five hours or less. In the discussion that ensued, the other five soldiers threw in with Bartho, and plans were quickly made for the test. The six soldiers started out from the company area in Shantytown. <laughs> Do you know, now I'm going to have to say something here. Do you know that, 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 that the word Shantytown... Uh, I'll bet, I'll bet a lot of people are not aware that various parts of various army camps are more socially acceptable than other parts of those same army camps. You know, I guess when a guy drives past Camp Killer, Camp Kilmer, or he drives past uh, a place like uh, Dick's, and he's never been in there, or he drives past Monmouth, he's never been in there either. He just thinks that's an army camp, and uh, it's all one big thing. Well, I suspect that if you were to come down from Mars and you took one look at New York City and you're sitting up there in your little spaceship looking down because you don't know anything about New York City, you would assume that New York City is just one great big city. It would be very hard to tell that the Lower East Side is very different from, say, uh, the Silk Stocking District around 57th Street. Uh, I mean, from that height. Well, in the Army, there are slums within the Army camp. And uh, these guys are sitting in a part of Fort Monmouth, or rather Camp Crowder, which I at one time festered in called Shantytown. That was a bunch of raggle-taggle barracks way out in the edge of camp where the, uh, how shall I put it, the marginal companies lived in the Sigma Corps. For example, the 282nd Pigeon Company. 
<laughs> which these guys were from, at the, the 282nd Pigeon Company are sitting in Shantytown. Okay? And they started at 7.20 a.m. from Shantytown over a course, which led first to Boulder City, then McIntyre, then the far side of Neosho, from there across the railroad tracks, and back home along the Incinerator Road. They returned to their starting point at 2.12 p.m. They covered the first five miles in double time, and from then on, they alternated their speed between normal and double time. But they never stopped for a break. The last half mile, they completed on the double and finished up with plenty of reserve stamina, including Private Wendt, who had walked guard for four hours the night before and who had requested to be relieved for the remainder of his tour so that he could make this magnificent march. They were cheered at the finish line by Lieutenant George A. Schink, company commander, and the entire company then escorted them to Chow, which had been held up pending their arrival. Lieutenant Schenk offered them three-day passes as their reward. Bring it up, Big Corny, all the way. Do you notice that they're not mentioning anything about what the other guys in the company said? Well, I want to tell you something about that. We had almost exactly the same thing happen. I was in this wire laying company. And now it's Company K, you see, and we were going through wire laying courses. And we're sitting there in Shantytown one day, just festering, bugged, going out on these 25 mile hikes every afternoon. Of course, they didn't start in the afternoon. In fact, you saw a picture one time of me just when I was about to start out on one of them. And uh, that was taken just before a 25 mile hike. And we get up the crack of dawn, and uh, everyone would fall out. You rush down a little train, you come back, and the dawn is just coming up over the Ozarks. And there's a chill breath of wind blowing in from somewhere near the big bend of the Ozark River. And you can smell dead catfish. And you can also smell the smell of 19 million mess halls for miles around, cooking the French toast in the morning kerosene. That is a special kind of kerosene they used to make French toast in. And you can just smell it drifting up to the sun. And we are preparing for a 25-mile hike. You go back in the barracks. You roll your you roll your pack up. You roll up your shelter hat. You stick your tent pegs in. You put your extra shoes in, which they insist on. Your three cans of sea rations, which they will not allow you to eat. You just carry them. Uh, <laughs> that's typical of the army. You know, you're, you're given the you. Oh, absolutely. Input. It was illegal to eat any of the sea rations. They were th they were to be carried. So you put the three cans of sea rations. One is beans with scrambled eggs. The other one is marked, no, that's good. No, I'm serious. The other one is marked uh, dinner, beef stew. And you'd look at that can, and all the while you're eating salt pork, and there's you've got a can of beef stew. You can't, you can't eat it. It's stuck in your pack. And then we would fill our, you notice it says their, their canteens are one quarter filled. Well, we used to fill our canteens. Now, guys filled it with a variety of things. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't always water, and uh, sometimes it was other things. I remember one time one of the guys in our barracks, Roswell T. Edwards, for example, had gotten himself a jug of bourbon somewhere from somewhere off in the hills, and that uh, we filled uh, our canteens with one quarter bourbon. But uh, I, and, uh, by the way, I put I put the bourbon in my canteen, in, and I was not a bourbon drinker, and I was not a drinker. I was only you know, 17 years old. My idea of of a good brisk drink was. Uh, Oh, uh, Ovaltine on rocks, stuff like that. Uh, I thought that, yeah, oh, 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 as a matter of fact, even at that time, I was not yet fully weaned to Pepsi-Cola because Pepsi made my nose burn. You know, I'd, I'd drink that stuff and the bubbles would go up, and I, I, I thought it was very strong stuff. So in came Edwards, say, and he's got this bottle. Well, you know, you're a soldier. Soldiers are supposed to want to do stuff like that, like, oh, man, would I like to have a drink, you know, all that. So he passes this bottle around to everybody and says, now listen, he says, I got this bottle. He says, I put it under my overcoat. I carried it into camp last night. Man, if I ever get caught, they'll bust me down to nothing. Well, of course, he already was nothing. Uh, you know, you can't bust a, a private down from much more than a private. But, you know, you, you have your pride. And so he says, bust me down to nothing. So he passes this bottle around. Me and Gasser, Goldberg, all the tough soldiers were taking a bottle we're pouring in our canteen. Oh, man, oh, this is going to be really, oh, you know, I pour this maybe a half a cup of bourbon into my into my canteen. 
I hand it over to Gasser, and Gasser pours a half a cup of bourbon in his canteen, and all of us are feeling real tough. So now it's the crack of dawn. We're out. We're going to go on the hike. The cannon goes off, and Company K moves out. Oh, boy, what a sight in the sun. With all of our M1s catching the sun, our green helmets with the camouflage netting with all the tw- it. We've got our packs on our backs, and we are marching out. The guidons are flying. Company K's magnificent, beautiful, we have, we've got a big flag that had a K on it, a big white circle on it. Company K's pennant, the American flag, and we are marching out. Company K is marching out, a 25-mile forced march. The dust is rising from under our shoes. You can hear the clink of the equipment, the rattle of M1s. You can hear the clank of canteen against musket, and they're marching out. Company K of the 362nd Signal Airborne Mesquite Repair Battalion is marching forward. Bring it up the crime thing. Hooray! And we marched out. Well, the best part of a, of, a, of a big forest march like that is the first three and a half minutes. <laughs> when you still feel good. The first three and a half minutes when the other guys all around, the other companies, M Company, L Company, Q Company, J Company, are all sort of walking around looking raggle-taggle, just like, you know, ordinary varmint soldiers. And there goes Company K, a hard-fighting, well-knit unit, marching out, marching out and stepping out. And up ahead of us, Lieutenant Cherry, up there by the guidon. You can see, he's still walking, by the way. He hasn't got his Jeep yet. He's putting on a big show for the regimental commander. Company Cherry, Company Company K being led by its fearless officer, Cherry. And he's howling, Aye! Aye! Right! And we salute the orderly rule as we go by. Eyes right. Company K is marching on out to the boondocks. And each one of us had one half a cup of bourbon in our canteens. <laughs> oh, what a sight. High overhead, the fleecy white clouds look down. The sun arched through the vaulted heavens, and the purple hills hung just on the other side of the rifle range as Company K moved out, stepping high and proud. All right, that's it. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, though, I don't think I've ever told this story. I know I've never told this story. The, the incident of the bourbon and the canteens. Well, uh, remember, we're tough soldiers. You know, we, we've seen plenty of Army movies. And the one thing about Army movies is that almost all Army movies are played by guys who are at least twice the age of real soldiers. Has that ever occurred to you, Corny? Oh, listen, James Whitmore playing a sergeant was at least double the age of any of the real sergeants that we had. Well, now let's take Lieutenant Cherry, for example. Uh, every time I see a, a lieutenant or an officer in the Army, he's played by uh, Gregory Peck. Yeah, a real grown-up man, high cheekbones and all that stuff. Or it's played by somebody like John Wayne, a big, uh, a powerful, obviously uh, grown-up type man. Well, Lieutenant Cherry, who was, we called the old man, Lieutenant Cherry had just passed his 21st birthday. Well, and he, he was the old man. Well, he really was the old man. Because the rest of us, uh, our age r- ranged between, I would say, roughly 17, where I was 17, you know. Uh, the average age of the, of, the, of the company was about 18 and a half. A uh, couple of guys were 19. I remember Zinsmeister was considered an old, grizzled veteran. Zinsmeister had just passed his 20th birthday. And guys used to sit around in a barracks. I remember coming, you know, Zinsmeister sitting there, and he's such an old man, you know, he's smoking a pipe, and he's, you know, a really grown-up type guy. And we'd say once in a while, Hey, Carl, Carl Zinsmeister, Hey, Carl. And uh, he'd look up and say, Yes, son. Well, uh, Carl... Uh, when you, when you, you know, when you, when you go out with a real woman, now, uh, when you actually go out with a real woman, now, now, how do you get around to, to, well, uh, 
What, 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 gee, you know, Carl. Well, son, uh, those things you only learn from experience. And uh, when you've been around and seen as many things as I have, you know that there are certain things which you can't just tell a man. He just has to experience. Now, don't bother me, son. I've got to get back to reading my paper. Well, <laughs> That was that was the old man at the company. See, since my son about twenty, so the rest of us, you know, were raggle tackle, and we had seen plenty of movies. That's the thing. I wonder how many people base their lives on movies. Oh, sure. I mean, even soldiers, you know, they they sit and watch the movies. They find out how real soldiers are by watching James Whitmore be a sergeant. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, believe me, I I think more guys base their their entire lives on the. How would Tony Curtis make this phone call? How? Uh, oh. How would the sure you? How would Michael Caine talk to this chick? And on the other hand, you have chicks saying to themselves, uh, "How would Julie Christie smile at this point?" <laughs> and uh, how would the? And so, ultimately, showbiz has become reality, and us walking around, we're unreality. And so here is Company K marching out into the sunlight. Now we've all been so uh, in this this at this particular moment in the army about four months long enough to be flat-bellied and hard and not long enough to have ever really seen any real soldiers. And so every night we're going down to see the movies. And about two or three days before, we had seen this great army movie where this guy named Errol Flynn. Was there ever such a guy, Errol Flynn? Ever heard of that? All right. Errol Flynn had this bunch of tough, hard-bitten GIs, see. And uh, it, was a, it was an outfit, almost like ours. You know, we had the same kind of hats, those big, round, uh, steel helmets to protect you from flying shell fragments or the, the enemy. And so uh, Company K, you got to follow this. It gets very complicated. Company K, three or four nights before, we went to the movies almost every night en masse. That was all we had to do, you know. We'd, uh, we'd finish chow, and we'd throw the food away that they gave us. We'd put on our, uh, our uh, Class A uniforms, which you had to wear if you were going to go to the post theater. We'd put on our Class A uniforms, our suntans, We'd go wandering down to the PX, and we'd buy a couple of uh, Baby Ruths, maybe a couple of uh, Powerhouse candy bars. That was our supper. Uh, then we'd uh, drink a bottle of 3.2 Army beer. Oh, boy, and there's no beer. I want to tell you something. Army beer, for any of you who've never tasted Army beer, Army beer, believe me, friends, is gassier than a stratospheric weather balloon. I, want to, I don't know what they made Army beer out of. There was a lot of rumors around there. But, of course, then uh, it just seemed ridiculous to us because they'd already done away with the cavalry, so nobody could see, you know. But there were a lot of rumors about where they actually got Army beer. And so we would sit there, and Army beer, you would open a bottle of Army beer, and it would go, wow! And the gas would fly out all over the place. It would foam and run up and down your elbows. And then you would take a sip of this. Now, you, you, you drink beer, Carney. You take a sip of this stuff. And it would be, uh, well, if you can imagine, a triple supercharged Diet Pepsi. Uh, this stuff, it was like solid gas. You'd take, and you'd take a swallow of it, and you'd sit there for a minute, and it would go down, and then you'd hear in your stomach, go, and you'd think you're having fun. You know, you'd bite, and then you'd bite a, a bite of your powerhouse candy bar. Nothing goes better, friends, together than a powerhouse candy bar and a bottle of of army beer. What a mixture. Do they still make powerhouse candy bars? You remember Mr. Powerhouse and all that? And so you, you'd, eat, you'd eat a... This is a typical army uh, high-life evening. We're sitting there, yellow light bulbs, gas are on one side of the table, me on the other side, Edwards over here, Goldberg sitting down at the end. And we've each got a bottle of 3.2 beer. And we're hard-bitten soldiers. We've been seeing them, but we know what soldiers are like. So you take a bite of this this powerhouse plant candy bar. See, Soldier eating a powerhouse candy bar. This is his supper, by the way, because uh, that evening we have been served a succulent dish of SOS for the 347th consecutive meal. And you grew tired of it about 322 meals back, and you cannot stand the sight of it. You've also been served a, uh, a big, beautiful, ice-cold glass of the Purple Death, uh, which is actually Army Grape Kool-Aid. So uh, by this time, you know, you've had the beets up to here. You're not eating the Army food. And now you're down at the down at the PX. That's part of the uh, uh, rejecting the establishment. 
No matter what they would give you in the army, they'd bring out a turkey, roast turkey, you know, with, with, a, with a suckling pig with an apple in its head. And you'd say, oh, get it, it's army chow. Ah, bah. And you'd go down and eat a powerhouse candy bar. Show them what you really thought. So, eat the powerhouse candy bar. Typical army moment. Powerhouse candy bar. Then you grab your bottle, your three-point, your army beer, see, which is all they would let you drink. The nuts are stuck in your teeth. And the chocolate, which is uh, uh, made out of some kind of a peculiar solidified lard, and the back of your teeth are coated with it. And you take the beer. Oh. Now, army beer does not taste really like beer. It, it tastes more like what you possibly would think uh, battery acid would taste like. It is very, very rare. And you... <coughs> And then down inside your stomach goes, it hits down, I see, and it mixes with the powerhouse candy bar. Then you take another bite of your powerhouse candy bar. Another slug of 3.2 army beer. When you do this about four times, the beer is gone, the powerhouse candy bar is gone, at least temporarily. Quite often it made a reappearance in a slightly altered form and slightly more violently, but quite often it made a reappearance. So now you're sitting there, see, and you say, Hey, Gasser, how about picking up four more beers? Here, here's a buck. And you reach down, you put the buck out. You buy the next one, man. Okay, all right, all right. And you got the empty can, see. So you take the can, and over over by the by the gateway there, where, where the little beer hole opens, by the gate they have a big can that says, Throw your beer cans here, and we mean you. So you take the can and you say, you pretend like you're dribbling. See, you whoop over your shoulder. The can goes, ding, 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 boing. You say, ah, Shepard cans another one. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, way down deep in your gut, way down there, you can hear, oh, something is calling. Oh, here it comes. And, and, and you're rising like a thermometer, you know, a gigantic bubble, an enormous bubble of pure, rarefied Swamp gas is coming up out of the depths of your gut. Out it comes, and <laughs> now I know it's in bad taste, friends. But life itself is in bad taste, right, Corny? And sometimes we just gotta face it. That's right. <laughs> well, now. Uh, we always felt a little bit, and I think there's a lot of people who even to this day, uh, as they walk around in their daily life, feel a little bit uh, secretly out of it because, well, they see these guys do this stuff in movies, and they do it so easily. For example, how many times have you seen Gary Cooper walk up to a bar, and the bartender says, Wallaby, and Cooper says, Whiskey. And he grabs that bottle of whiskey. He pours it into a glass, and he goes like this, corn. Go on. Nothing happens. Not only does nothing happen, but his eyeballs don't pop out. Well, now, you know what would happen, Corny, if you ever drank some of that red eye that those guys are laying down in that bar, and you drank it down like that, it would go like this. You'd, you'd grab the glass, and you'd go... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Black <laughs> eyeballs, sweat. <whistles> Holy smokes! But it doesn't do that to Cooper. He just drinks that like he's drinking Diet Pepsi. You know, just <sighs> that's all he does. So no wonder we feel inferior to the movie guys. And then came the incident of the bourbon in the canteens. Now, I don't know whether you know anything, friends, about Missouri, about that area, but that is bourbon country, Neosho, Missouri. Just like you go down to the islands, it's rum country, right? You go to Edinburgh, it's Scotch whiskey country. You go to England, gin. I mean, gin is their national drink, and it's a national art form. Now, uh, like all other art forms, there is the good and the bad. Now, we sit over here in America, you know, 
We get British gin, and generally we only get the very best. Beef eaters, you know, that fine British gin. You get the fine, the fine scotch from Scotland. Because what's the point of sending the, you know, sending the bad stuff over? Because you know, <laughs> they only send the good. Just like we only see the good English pictures. We only see the good Italian pictures. You don't, oh, let me tell you, the English have shot some pictures, believe me. I mean, they're about as effective as Novocaine. They put your head to sleep so fast. You've seen them, Corny, from the, oh, they're awful. <laughs> and uh, uh, rum, let's take the islands and rum. You know about that. I mean, we only get the best rum up here from the islands. But, oh, listen, they make some rum down there, friend, that makes uh, varnish remover taste good. True? That's the air walking around rum. <laughs> well, now, that's the same with bourbon, friends. Now, what, uh, you're sitting here, you know, and the only time you ever think of bourbon, you think of Jack Daniels. Uh, fine bourbon. You think of uh, Jim Beam, something like that, or a wild turkey, you know, real bourbon. Friend, they make bourbon down in those Missouri hills, Dad. They make bourbon down there that is sometimes aged as long as 12 minutes. That stuff, <laughs> that stuff is made for only one purpose, to lay you out flat on your you-know-what. It is not made to talk about at Downey's Bar. It is not made to pour over rocks. As a matter of fact, I mean, the only time that that stuff is ever poured over rocks, it's poured over real rocks after it's used. That's about it. I mean, they don't know from rocks. And so <laughs> so old Edwards had gone into that lovely little flowering community right in the heart of the Ozarks, Neosho, Missouri. And he had bought himself a great big jug of real Neosho, Missouri bourbon. That's walking around spitting, drinking bourbon. That ain't sending to the Downey's Bar bourbon. I mean, it's the kind of stuff that you can use to, uh, well, you can take use it to take paint off your hands. Uh, you can use it to clean paintbrushes. Uh, you can use it to start bonfires. Uh, <laughs> you can use it in case your car runs out of antifreeze. You pour a couple of bottles of this in the front of it. This stuff is about 197 proof. I mean it, man. And the kind of proof that it is, it's proof. I mean, it's the kind of proof, believe me, that grows hair on your hair. That kind of stuff. Very angry stuff. But it looks like real bourbon. It's got the same color. You know, it's kind of nice and golden color. And we poured it, each one of us, about a quarter of a cup. And I don't know whether you've ever seen a canteen cup, but a canteen cup is about like uh, the average bucket. I mean, it's a big cup. Well, each one of us put about a quarter of a cup into our, into our, our mess kits, or rather into our canteens. That was it. Now, we had seen this big picture about two or three days before with Errol Flynn and all of his soldiers. And there was a scene with Errol Flynn. I mean, these guys were in Burma or someplace. And there's a scene with Errol Flynn and his guys, and one of them has got a bottle of whiskey. And, uh, and they're, oh, they're tough-looking soldiers, and their coats are torn off, and they they wear nothing but shirts. And you could see they've got cartridge belts around their, around their waist, and they've got just shorts with the pants torn off, and they're torn up old shoes, and somebody's got a bottle of whiskey, and the five of them are passing it around. Oh, boy. And they always make that thing in the movies about, isn't that good? Oh, boy, with that drink. Oh, you've seen that scene in the movies. And they pass it around, and the five of them drink up this bottle of whiskey in about two and a half minutes. You know, each guy takes a great big lug, and he puffs down like it's, like it's knee-high orange. No problem. Well, we knew how soldiers should be. We all knew this. We knew that we should be tough. We knew how hard it was to be a soldier. We knew that uh, we were all grown-up men. We knew that we should drink beer, whiskey, and like it. But we all secretly, and I'm going to tell you this for myself, every time I drank that 3.2 beer, I hated it. Oh, did it taste terrible. And it made me, it made my nose tickle, and it was gassy. It made me dizzy. And everybody else, you know, they looked like they were drinking it. But so did I. Gasser probably thought I liked it. Edwards probably thought Gasser liked it. And everybody is trying to impress the other guy, and everybody thinks the other guys are really doing it. I just wonder how many people go to a, go to a discotheque, for example. I mean, you know, they hear about this discotheque, they read about it in Vogue, 
And they go down there, and the flashing lights, the psychedelic scene is going on, and the music is playing at 4,000 decibels over zero, and your eardrums are popping, and your head is popping, and and you're in there five minutes, and you got a headache that don't, you, <laughs> you got a headache that just won't stop. Your head is popping. It's, it's you know, it's Bustville, and you you have this feeling, oh, gee, look at all those other people are really enjoying it. All those other people are really digging it. Oh, what's the matter with me, for crying out loud? And then you get out, you know, and you start doing the boogaloo and the whole bit, and the band is playing, and your head is popping. But the real secret is, in this crowd, if there's 100 people in the crowd, 98 of them also got a headache. And 98 of them think the other guys are really digging it. It's only me that isn't. And even Truman Capote there is not digging it. He's also got a headache. But you got to play the game. Company K is marching out into the sunlight, marching out past the rifle range, marching out past the motor pool, <laughs> marching out past life, marching out past Company D and Company M, Company A, Company B and C, out past the 423rd Airborne Battalion, out past the 2nd Division, out past the 2nd Army Barracks Headquarters. Moving on out. Past the WAC Barracks. Whee! Out we go. Each one of us with one quarter of a cup of Neosho Missouri bourbon in our canteen. On we march. Flags flying. And then we started to really march. Now... You, you sort of get into a groove after a while, and the sun is getting higher and higher and higher and higher. It is right in midsummer, right in the middle of the Ozarks, and man, that gets awful hot. I mean, there is not a breath of air stirring. And I remember going along this yellow, uh, not a, not quite gravel road, a kind of a yellow clay road, and we were in a long file of men. We were about four abreast, roughly. And all strung out, each one of us carrying 80 pounds of stuff on our back. And that's what that is. The pack actually weighs 79 pounds. You've seen that pack? That's the actual official GI weight of that pack. And, you know, you carry 79 pounds between your shoulder blades. For 25 miles, man, you are putting out an awful lot of foot pounds. Right, Corny? Well, we start... We start moving into that jog now. You know, we've been on dozens of these 25-mile hikes, and, they, you know, we're kind of used to them. And you move into a jog, and your head starts to fall asleep. You're slogging forward, you know. <laughs> and there's a little talk in the ranks. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the guys, there's, there's that continuous, continuous hum of talk. And it's talk. You don't hear, you don't see this in, in Army movies. You know, in the movies of armies, they always show... James Whitmore running up and down and all that. And the army, it, it just sort of, it sort of de deteriorates and really works itself into a, just a, a, like a caterpillar. Nobody really is a unit anymore by himself. You're just part of this great mob. It's a caterpillar with a thousand feet. And you're just moving along. And the sweat starts rolling down your cheeks. And the dust is raising up from the guys ahead of you. And washing back over the, over the company and back over the guys behind you. And then the sound of equipment clinking together. Just the sound like this. And just the clink, 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 clink. When you start hearing other things, ding, ding, ding. It's, it's the, it's the top of somebody's mess kit banging against this canteen cup. And you just hear this. And you hear motors roaring up and down once in a while when a jeep goes by. You don't even look up. And then you hear the, the, the sergeant once in a while howling. All right, pull in those lines. Put out the guard. Put out the flankers. Let's go with those flankers. Move on out further. Now, maybe you don't know this, but all Army guys do, that every line of march has guys that are marching parallel to it. Way out in the boondocks, they're called the flankers. There to protect the line of march. If anybody's attacking from the sides, they're way out. They're oh, a couple of hundred yards, and they're off the road, and they're having a rotten time. They're struggling through swamps. They're struggling through trees, through the weeds, rocks, 
And they're strung out, all these flankers way out there. And every 15, 20 minutes, they pull in the flankers and send out new flankers. And, you know, you're a flanker then. And you come, you pull in, and you're back again. And move on, 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 on. You never thought of an army march quite like this, did you, man? <laughs> we march. And then every, oh, I'd say about every hour or so, every hour or so, you'd hear it passing back down the line. You'd hear this guy, oh, take a five-minute break. All right, fall out, fall out, fall out. And you'd sit down instantly. And everybody lights up who is going to smoke. Everybody lights up a cigarette. You don't take your pack off. You sit on it. Everybody sits down on the pack. And they wait. And it's like almost before you sat down, they're blowing a whistle. All right, come on, let's go on your feet, forward, perch. You hear it, company after company. Forward, perch, forward, Come on, come on, come on, come on. On they go again. <laughs> something is hanging over. Well, I would suspect that the first one that it happened to was Gasser. Gasser. We took a break. It was about our second or third break. And I took out my canteen. I was thirsty. My tongue was hanging down around my cartridge belt. I took my canteen out. Boy, was I thirsty. Ah! Oh. Oh. That, oh. That Neosho. Two dollar a gallon. Bourbon. It burnt the hair right off my tongue, and I was thirsty. Now, friends, I had not brought any water with. All I had was one half a cup, canteen cup, of two dollar a gallon rot gut bourbon in my canteen cup. Have you ever tried to quench an unquenchable thirst, friend? with bad booze. Now, it's one thing if you call wanting to get drunk a thirst. It ain't. I'm talking about a thirst where your tongue is about as big around as a football and it's covered with a thick coating of yellow dust and there's uh, cotton coming off of your teeth and every time you spit, it bounces. Well, <laughs> man, I'll tell you. I was going out of my skull. This stuff tasted like battery acid. It sure didn't do anything for my thirst. I took a little... Oh, and it made me thirstier. Absolutely thirstier. Because it, it, it had a, a sort of sour, bitter taste. You know that, that minute after you've taken a swallow of booze and it comes, <clears throat> it comes back up, it tastes that sour, bitter taste? Well, I sat there for a minute. The first time that it happened, I said to myself, well, at the next break... The next break, I'm going to get myself some water. The hell with this bourbon. And all the other GIs are sitting around me pretending like it's such a great idea having bourbon in your canteen cup. And I could see the same look in the other guy's eyes. But I, at that time, was so innocent, I thought that they were real soldiers, and I was faking it. That they were real tough guys, and they were going to be knocking down the bourbon. Well, now, we started out of camp... About 8 o'clock in the morning. It is now 1 o'clock. We have covered endless, endless, dusty foothills of the Ozark Miles. We are covered with crud from head to foot. The sweat has caked on the back of my neck. I am chafed where my, where my strap from my gas mask has dug deep into my shoulder blades. And I am so thirsty, I'm telling you, I'm going out of my skull. I do not think, friends... There is any worse torture than extreme, aggravated thirst. I mean that. I think one of the best ways, you know, the Nazis did it all the time. One of the best ways to get a guy to talk is just don't give him any water. Period. Just don't give him any water. You don't have to hit a guy in the head burn his feet with cigarettes and that. Just don't give him any water. Day after day after day. 
and then have the guard stand outside of his his little cage, drinking ice water. Man, there ain't no feeling like it. You have no idea how how uh, magnificent water gets, and how you begin to have you begin to have uh, fantasies about it, like a uh, water bottled in uh, stone mugs with the Florentine designs on it. <laughs> you know, as if water is the rarest of elixirs. On well, about one o'clock in the afternoon, I was so out of my skull with thirst that every time we would stop, we had. We had, we must have had 500 breaks, but every time we stopped, we were 16,000 miles from nowhere. And we were supposed to, on this extended march, carry all our own material with us. No water is being carried by the company. It is drink what's in your canteen cups or die. Forget it. On about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Thirst had driven me right up the wall. I started to drink this stuff out of the canteen. I couldn't help it. Oh, oh, but it was wet. It was wet. That's what counted. It was wet. Oh, boy, was it wet. Mm. I take it on. <laughs> My eyeballs pop, but it's wet. Oh. Nobody talks much when you're on a 25-mile march. After about the first three or four hours, ain't nobody saying nothing. Everybody's real quiet. You sit there, and that's, by the way, very different from the way it is in the movies. You notice how it is in the movies all the time? James Whitmore sits down, and he immediately reaches inside of his field jacket and takes out a picture of his girl and shows it to the next G.I. I ain't never seen that happen once in the Army. It just, that's, that's, an, army, that's an Army movie cliché. Guys just sit there. Ain't saying nothing. And you see a sergeant go by with the lieutenant, and they've got the map out, and they're looking at the compass. We don't care. We don't care where we're going. We just want to get there. We are tired of this. I take another little sip. Oh, and it burns all the way down. And all I've had to eat... All I've had to eat since 8 o'clock this morning is one chocolate bar, that very same chocolate bar that they talked about in this piece that I read to you. Now, the Army chocolate tastes like, uh, well, I, it tastes like cocoa-flavored milk of magnesia. It is special Army chocolate, and it's supposed to have vitamins in it. Actually, what it has in it is plaster of Paris. And they've given each one of us this as our emergency special iron rations to eat on the march. And I've been gnawing away at this chocolate bar and mixing it with $2 a gallon Neosho, Missouri, Rotgut, Red Eye. It was an explosive mixture. Well, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon that I began to notice a funny thing. My helmet was shrinking. It was pushing down on my ears. I had never known this before. In all the... It seemed like I'd worn this helmet night and day for 125 years. And the damn thing is shrinking. It is pushing on each ear, and my ears began to hurt. They began to hurt like they were being pressed next to my head. Well, we went about another four or five miles, and I noticed another funny thing, which was the first time that I had noticed this happening. It's a strange thing that I, I noticed the guy ahead of me. His feet were somehow coming back further than they were coming, than they had been going before. And that I, I kept seeing his feet directly below my feet all the time. Well, we sat down. And this was the first suspicion I had that something really was going wrong. I sat down on the back of my pack. Now, this is a very delicate balancing movement. You sit on the back of your pack, and you loosen the top of the straps a little bit, but you don't let it get off your back, because the minute you do that, man, you start getting even more tired. You know, it's like letting the load down. You want to hold it up, because you get, you got to keep it on your back. So I, I sat down with the with this thing, with the pack on my back, pulled my feet up, but over backwards. 
It was the first time that my pack tipped over backwards and my feet were sticking up in the air. Well, I, I rocked back and forth, turned over on my side. I was a little embarrassed because, you know, uh, an old army soldier does not allow his pack to overthrow him. I rolled over on my side and I couldn't get up. I couldn't pull my pack up. Somebody, and uh, this is absolutely, the, what a rotten trick. The first time anybody did it, you know, there's rotten things and then there's really rotten things. I noticed that, at least I began to suspect, that somebody had secretly put four bowling balls in my pack. I couldn't, I couldn't move the damn thing. While I pushed around sideways, I got my knee up against the butt of my rifle, and I hunched myself up. I sat up now with my helmet pushing down on my ears, and by George, there, with his pack hiding, riding up over his head, was Roswell T. Edwards. He, too. I said, what's the matter, Edwards? Well, he sounded like he was talking to me through an echo chamber. I don't know quite what he said, but from somewhere off in the distance, I heard whistles blowing. And we are now up and away again. Company K is moving forward into the darkness, moving forward. Well, at the next break, it happened. Gasser stood up, flipped his pack off, rushed for the weeds, and for at least seven and one-half minutes, a large, almost overwhelming retching sound could be heard. Well, it's catching, friends. I don't know whether you've ever been on a boat when, uh, when people began to pass sea sound. All I've got to say is the 236 men out of Company K found themselves en masse, by the numbers, heaving in the boondocks. It was one of those brief moments of total communion with your fellow man. I'm telling you, it, the, <laughs> the stuff was sloshing around my shoes. I didn't know whether it was mine or Edward's, and I didn't care. And Lieutenant Cherry stood over us and said, All right, men, now you know. Now you know what it means on being not in condition. That's what's doing that to you. He never did find out about the bourbon. He thought we were not in condition. But from that moment on, I learned a great truth. Life ain't the way James Whitmore wants you to believe. The next time I see Gary Cooper walk into that bar at a silver dollar and say, Wasky. And then when that Wasky comes, comes sliding down the bar to him, and he raises up that little shot glass and he's going, like he's drinking a glass of water. I know he's lying. It ain't that way at all. Let's admit it. Let's admit it. It's not easy to like whiskey. In fact, there's a lot of things that we like to pretend we like. I know a guy that's been pretending about cigars for years.